Hey everyone, Steve here from PC Budget Solutions, and I'm gonna complain. I'm sorry. I'm tired. It is Wednesday, 5:30 p.m. I've spent since Sunday benchmarking. I've spent Sunday and Monday doing Ryzen 9, i9. Tuesday, part of Monday and the rest of Tuesday, and into this morning on Ryzen 5 vs i5. When you have a launch like this where there's some issues like precision boost overdrive not working, BIOS issues, etc., you really have to do a lot of testing. I found out that my Ryzen 9 results in one benchmark, World of Warcraft, need to be revisited. Luckily, only one came out. Thank God. But today, we have two processors, about the same class, $200 and $220 is what I paid for them. $200 for Ryzen, $220 for um, Intel. And we're going to take a look, essentially, and we're going to call this, uh, you know, it, it, can Ryzen take the best gaming CPU crown for less than $250? And I'm not going to tell you now, you have to come along for the ride, but there's a really good chance that that crown is walking away with AMD this time. So let's talk about the setups. They're identical. The only difference being the processor and the motherboard that's used. So the i5 9600K, the AMD Ryzen 5 3600. I did have to put on an MSI X570 Gaming Edge Wi-Fi. None of the B450 boards are flashing in my house, and I have three of them. We're still using the Gigabyte Z390 Aorus Elite. Do note, I downgrade to the H100i because... To me, using a $150, $160 AIO on a $200 processor does not seem like a good budget solution. So I felt uh, a um, AIO between like 80 and 100 being the maximum. Yes, did run to a little bit of thermal limits with overclocking, but again, we do real world uh, benchmarking on PC budget solutions. Same testing setup, high across the board pretty much, except GTA 5 had a little bit of very high mixed in, and 4 auto runs on extreme because it just runs high FPS regardless. Uh, there were no outliers, again, in this testing, uh, because I made sure I retested if there were, and I managed to get all them out. I have multiple programs running for monitoring, something I normally run anyhow, and then 4 Chrome tabs open with a YouTube video playing on loop. A few really quick assumptions. Motion blur is off when available. The secondary display is always running at technically 1080 by 1920 because it's turned sideways. Only use GPU precision boost and it did boost to just a hair over 2000 megahertz. Memory was automatically overclocked with the XMP function and both systems ran at 3600 megahertz. I did not adjust any fan curves. These were on open benches and the synthetics had very few programs open, games that have multiple as we discussed. So a couple quick disclosures. Again, AMD capped out at 4.3 gigahertz. Um, stock is 4.2, by the way, uh, for precision boost overdrive, which pretty much did work on this chip, surprisingly. Intel stock ran a 4.3 all-core boost, and we overclocked a 4.6. Now, yes, can you go five gigahertz? Of course. I'm not going to put a CPU cooler that costs nearly as much as this processor. That doesn't make sense. This is real world benchmarking. This isn't put it in a vacuum. If you buy a uh, like a 360 millimeter Corsair NZXT radiator with a $220 processor, I'm sorry, that just that doesn't make sense to me. So that's why we then went to 4.6. That's as far as I can go before we had some thermal issues. And again, I, I try to. Um, you know, keep it stable as well. Uh, 1.4 volts was required to overclock AMD, which is reported as not being safe. Uh, 1.35, 325 volts is what everybody's saying, don't go past. So keep that in mind. Uh, this is a chip that I'm keeping internally, so it is what it is. Uh, temps were normalized to 20 degrees uh, Celsius ambient, and it did get close to 30 degrees. And the wild tests are tested uh, going both directions on the flight path. It is not a PC budget solutions video if we don't have Cinebench. And this test, I know some reviewers don't like it, but I like it a lot. It shows some things in theory, even though I try to avoid those. Then again, those same benchmarkers will also run games with everything turned off in a perfect vacuum. So same thing in my opinion. But uh, multi-core forms, no shocker. Uh, one bows what you expected, a little over 25%. 
What we want to harp on is the single core performance. The stock i5 lost against the stock uh, Ryzen 5, and the overclocked i5 lost against the overclocked Ryzen 5, except for um, Cinematch R15, they tied. That's really, really interesting, uh, especially in um, R20, how big the difference was. Uh, stock to stock, I thought it was a pretty telltale sign. Blender, uh, these results were expected. I was a little bit surprised on how much gain the Intel chip got with just 300 megahertz, uh, increased by almost half a, half a minute. Uh, AMD at, at 100 megahertz increased by like maybe a third, or no, not a quarter, like a fifth of a minute. But uh, AMD obviously winning this one in Blender. Uh, Adobe, th that's coming up here and it's a really interesting test. I've run this test a few times and the results were a bit surprising. AMD should have won by more than uh, what it did. And there's actually a reason why AMD didn't. So Intel with QuickSync really helps with encoding a lot. And this chip has QuickSync. So one of the key takeaways here is I think the i5 actually is okay for video editing. It's not going to be as good as AMD, but I would go to say that I think it's, it's closer than a 25% margin. Um, so the margin of win is much lower than what SMT would normally add. So that's definitely a good one for uh, Intel here. This benchmark is going to cause me to redo other benchmarks, specifically the Ryzen 9 version, because the Ryzen 5 scored almost 20 FPS higher, I think, in uh, overclocked. And a 1440p it actually snuck out surprisingly a decent win. I will say this, the 1440p results can go back and forth. Um, the problem is, is depending on what weather you run into during the flight path and kind of, you know, if you intercept anybody <clears throat> can change the results. Uh, the 1080p, I think, is still telling that the game has always been really favored towards towards uh, Intel chips. And uh, it shows here, not by much, by very little. But even though AMD won at 1440p, I'm going to say Intel won this battle. And GTA 5 surprised me. Obviously, Intel got to win overclock to 4.6, but the fact that the stock Ryzen chip outperformed the Intel chip, and for some reason, a little bit of stuttering on, on both chips, a little more on the Intel chip at stock, but I noticed a little bit of stuttering. Uh, but yeah, definitely really interesting, the fact that at stock, uh, AMD actually won in overclock. They obviously lost by a very little small margin, but GTA 5 normally favors Intel. Not very surprising here. Uh, very, very, very close performance across the board, uh, running uh, 1080p high and 1440p high, respectively. Uh, pretty much, I'm going to call this a dead heat. Uh, Intel pulled out a little bit of a win at 1440p, overclocked, but um, I think that really comes down to margin of error. Uh, the results were all pretty close across the board. What I will say about For Honor is consistently across all my testing, Intel was about two, right around two FPS ahead of AMD. Uh, if you, you know, these are averaged together, but uh, 1440p, they're dead even, obviously. There is a little bit of a, a bottleneck with the GPU, but uh, 1080p, very close stock or overclock. Very, very, very close. Despite this being an AMD-centric game, obviously the i5 has a bit of a victory here. When overclocked, it pulled about 3% ahead, but at stock, they were pretty much dead even. So what that really tells me is, more than anything else, clock speed is the most important for the Division 2. Very similar story with Ghost Recon Wildlands. Um, 1080p, clock speed's really important. 1440p kind of sort of there too uh, interestingly enough so the overclocked ryzen did beat out the stock i5 um, but again clock speed is definitely going to be king here so this is where this leaves us gaming standpoint stock versus stock ryzen basically performed at 98.82 percent and Intel performed 99.52. So n neither one actually clearly swept gaming. It's very close. A uh, Intel did have a slight lead, but overall. Synthetics, AMD swept it. Uh, was even close. Um, almost 19%. And then overall, 
AMD is walking away at stock performance um, from a vantage point 99.41 percent versus 90.28. And what I do is I, I I always pin it against the better results. So uh, when you compare everything, all things considered, you get the percentage. But clearly. There is a clear advantage with AMD, uh, almost no compromises at stock with game performance and multi-core performance. Uh, they definitely have this one down packed. And I forgot to mention that synthetics include a single thread of benchmarks. So it's not just multi-core performance. So in this particular uh, scenario, overclocked, Intel definitely has a decisive one, almost 2% win, 99.93 versus 98.07. So that's, uh, you know, right around like 1.8, 1.7 something, or 1.8 something, I believe, yeah, 1.86. Um, synthetics really did not improve at all. Uh, sure, overall performance, um, you know, was there about 8% there, 7.5%, but... Let's take a look at value. I think value is really going to tell the story here. Now, this is a little bit of a chart of the future. Here's the reason why. In the future, you'll be able to buy good uh, B450 boards and pair them with Ryzen 3rd uh, Gen or 3000 series. The problem is, right now, some of the B450 boards are having trouble flashing and compatibility, so can't necessarily run and do that right now. But at Micro Center, and this is leaning towards Intel a little bit, but Micro Center has the 9600 or 9600K at 220 and the 3600 at 200. Everywhere else, that 9600K is closer to 250. I'm assuming the Intel build is going to be $70 more. It's probably closer to like 100, but regardless. In this case, um, gaming the value, so you know, AMD has 100% of the value because they're the cheaper platform by $70, and this is on a roughly $1,000 system, so keep that in mind, which is pretty typical, uh, anywhere from 1000 to like maybe 1300 or we'll say 800 to 1300 uh, They win value, 100% cost value because they're the cheaper platform. Uh, when you factor in gaming performance versus cost, uh, clear win uh, by 3%. When you look at total value, also a clear win and that one's by eight percent and when we look at workloads still a win by a little bit over 12 percent same story here a thousand seventy dollar build roughly uh, when you multiply that by the oc performance it's still a clear walk away victory for amd uh, synthetic workloads uh just under 12 percent overall uh, we're looking at right around 7%. Gaming, still 2.5%. Uh, this really paints the picture of with how close the game performance is, you're getting a tremendously, tremendously better value from AMD with Ryzen 3000 series versus Intel's 9th generation core processors. Previously on this channel, Intel came with a $500 crown and through a lot of clawing and fighting, Got roughed up pretty bad. Intel left with the $500 gaming crown. Today, Intel walks in with a crown of about $220. They are not leaving today with the crown. The Intel platform is approximately $50 to, 70, 50 to $100 more expensive than, than AMD is at the, well, so we'll say all in cost, $300 to $400 price point. For board and processor. However, at stock, the chips were pretty much dead even. Uh, I actually, aimed, I think it was dead even. I think they were like right there. I think Intel squeaked out a half percentage win. Overclock, yes. Intel definitely did win that by two, three percent. No doubt about that. And again, I'm not going to throw a stupidly overpowered Kohler on it because who's going to buy? $150, $170 CPU cooler for a processor that costs like $220, $250. Nobody would do that. You would spend, you'll get more gains over give up a few hundred megahertz versus a next tier up GPU, right? Literally like $60, $70 can go from a RTX 2060 Super to an RTX 2070 Super, right? So that's pretty much it. AMD used to require, with early rise in first and second gen, or Zen Plus rather, some compromise for gaming for better multi-threaded performance. But today, for $300 to $400 for a board and a CPU, you are not compromising in gaming. You're getting essentially the same performance. You're getting better multi-core performance. 
And maybe, just maybe, when all the um, bugs are worked out of the motherboards and boosting and all that fun stuff, this chip might actually beat Intel across the board. That still has to be seen. We don't know. It's just a guess. But I'm honestly very happy with this Ryzen versus Intel test. It really delivered this time. I recommend it. But one other thing. I will go to say this. Other than just not being a terrific value at this price point, the 9600K is a decent chip. And let me paint the picture. For Adobe workloads, QuickSync really makes up for having no hyper-threading. If you go out and say buy a really inexpensive 360 radiator cooler like I did, I spent like 60 bucks on my cooler used. Now I did slap on about $40 in good fans. You know, then you can overclock even further and get uh, even a little bit more of a lead, right? Maybe another uh, three or four percent maximum, depending on the game. I think there's definitely a place for Intel. That being said, I'm just having a lot of difficulty recommending it because AMD will do everything Intel does and then do some things Intel does but a fair bit better right and that's kind of where we're at so if you like this video liked it definitely dislike I guess hit the dislike button I feel like this was a good video uh, comment you guys are commenting on other video like no tomorrow really love that get subscribed I just hit a thousand subs I can start monetizing make a little bit of money to buy more stuff so I'm excited about that uh, buy stuff in the links in the description below um, and that's pretty much it. There's a lot more content coming here soon. As always, this is Steve from PC Budget Solutions, and I'll see you later on down the road.